if there's no questions for, for people, uh, feel free to speak up if I'm missing a notification here. Maybe we'll dive into the slides. And, and this really starts the substantive part of the course. So welcome. Um, as I noted last time, this course will proceed uh, in a set of stages. Uh, and uh, the first stage is uh, really a um, sort of a, a, a vision statement, articulation of a vision. Uh, I noted uh, last time that um, this course is unusual uh, across Canada um, and indeed internationally for um, advancing the, um, the conviction uh, of the need for a new type of science, uh, a science that builds on two areas, two spheres of science that have been rapidly advancing by virtue of, of computational progress, system science and data science. And really this is about uh, synthesizing them into a, uh, a whole, a whole that's greater than the sum of these parts. Um, and we'll see some major themes of this whole and some of the major reasons why it's needed within this lecture. Um, we'll then be going on uh, to, to dive into one side of this, the system science side, doing a whirlwind, um, glim uh, whirlwind uh, tour of um, communicable disease modeling, uh, particularly in compartmental traditions, but also some in agent-based modeling tradition. Uh, and uh, that will set us up to launch with some discussions of uh, machine learning uh, approaches that articulate with it. Um, so, you know, when I think about um, the motivations for the material in this course, um, uh, I think about the challenges of communicable disease as exemplars of more general um, health policy challenges. Um, and, and these are challenges that are um, not only in an informal sense, but in a technical sense, complex. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. Um, but uh, the challenges of communicable disease and, and infectious disease transmission uh, of preventing and controlling infectious disease outbreaks, whether it be COVID-19 or STIs or zoonoses like West Nile and, and Lyme disease or, or um, you know, outbreaks of, um, of, of foodborne illness or waterborne illness. Um, uh, these are uh, examples of um, uh, complex uh, health challenges. And, and those were some of the first areas in which uh, researchers started to grapple with, um, with the features of complexity. Uh, they are though emblematic of a broader class of problems that we know as examples of, of complex systems. Um, and I've listed a set here uh, that, that go beyond uh, communicable disease. Um, uh, what we call syndemics of mutually interacting conditions. A um, lot of talk recently about, you know, fluorona and uh, the interaction of flu and COVID-19 um, uh, or, or two different variants of COVID-19. But um, if we look beyond uh, the obvious, what you see is COVID-19 is tied up with, um, with the burden of, uh, of overdoses from um, from opioids. Uh, it's tied up with um, challenges associated with domestic violence um, and substance abuse and mental health challenges. Um, these syndemics uh, are, are structured features of our health landscape that are troublingly uh, established and difficult to address. Um, and uh, Many of the challenges we deal with in society are rooted in these, these syndemics, where it is about one condition, but it's also about another, and they're entangling. Um, we have many other spheres in which um, researchers have been grappling with this complexity, but it's really in the infectious disease area um, that uh, some of these challenges were first articulated. And if we look at COVID-19, you know, we start to to see um, many of the motivations for, um, for tackling these issues from a complex systems perspective. Um, you know, health policymakers are from the very inception of the outbreaks uh, 
within North America been struggling to handle um, the uh, you know rush of of needs that come at them. Um, an important component of that need is is making sense of the evidence. Um, and what I've shown here is a set of curves um, showing different lines of evidence that those in New York City were confronted with in the opening months of the pandemic. Um, uh, so we have, for example, um, new cases uh, shown here in brown. Um, but we also have test volumes um, that to some degree reflected and to some degree drove uh, some of those uh, findings on reported cases. Um, and we see that as test volumes uh, changed, uh, cases changed along with them. There was an association there. Um, we see test positivity shown here in, in orange, starting uh, you know, terribly high and uh, coming down over time in ways that are somewhat reassuring, but still pointing to you know, numbers of cases in the community. We see a uh, number of people in hospital in, in, in yellow and in green, number in ICU. And all this evidence is coming to, to policymakers. And of course, it's not coming in isolation. Um, these things are related to each other. These are not solitudes as, as time series. Uh, what goes on in tests um, is a reflection and likely somewhat of a driver for what's going on in terms of reported cases. There's this intertwining, this entangling of these different sets of data. As the pandemic has progressed, we've turned to novel sorts of, of uh, sources of evidence. Data from smartphones, from social media, from wastewater, some, um, all of which are areas that our work taps into uh, heavily. Um, and we turn to these to help uh, complement our blind spots or help make up for our blind spots to help uh, recognize that many people who are ill or infected may not know it, or even if they know it, they may not present for testing. Maybe these days they use rapid antigen test kits at home and don't even call in a positive to public health and therefore don't get included in as a reported case. So policymakers have been dealing with, with these challenges. And of course, they're dealing with them not not merely as uh, bemused observers, um, as curious intellectual phenomenon, but because they wanna bend these curves, right? From the opening weeks of the pandemic, we heard that clarion call. Um, but naturally, when you see you know, evidence of this rushing at you, it brings up questions in one's mind, you know, what do we need to bend these curves effectively? What interventions will be most effective? Is it expanding testing? Is it in, uh, enhancing the resources for contact tracing? Is it a mass vaccination campaign these days? Is it um, efforts to boost those who already have, um, you know, have um, had two previous doses so they're stronger yet? Is it, um, helping to expedite the rollout of, of vaccines in schools or putting in place school vaccination requirements. Now to grapple with these challenges um, during the pandemic particularly, uh, decision makers have turned to uh, insights gathered um, and, um, and revealed by two computational traditions. Um, traditions that form the basis for this course, uh, but whose complementarity and synergies have been underappreciated. System science on the one hand to the left and data science to the other. And we're gonna be talking in this uh, course and indeed in this lecture about each of these traditions and um, talk about why these are, are so, um, so naturally compatible and why these traditions need each other. Let's start with system science. Since the 1700s, um, observers have noted the, um, the patterns that characterize spread of infectious diseases. Um, uh, these are observations of the bubonic plague in, in London in the, in the 1700s that played such a big role in, in shaping the lives of, of, of early luminaries, including Isaac Newton. Uh, we see oscillations um, 
uh, historically into the 20th century for childhood infectious diseases. So for example, measles up here on the left and pertussis here on the lower right, um, two conditions again on, on which we've done uh, much work. And here in Saskatchewan, you know, chicken pox or measles and mumps um, exhibit these oscillations just as much as you know, England and Wales do. Um, uh, and you know, early researchers within this sphere, those working in the, the 20s and 30s and 40s, were seeking to understand why do we see such you know, troublingly high numbers of, of, of infected children on some years and such low numbers in, in other years? Um, what is it that is driving the cycle and how can we, how can we mitigate it? How can we lessen it? Um, you know, as time has gone on, researchers have recognized in the later part of the 20th century that what we're seeing here is um, more generally representative of a class of complex systems. These systems where at a technical level, um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This is not merely a, um, a platitude, it's true in a, in a deep technical sense. And in dynamically complex systems, um, the behavior of the whole can be very distinct from the parts. Traditionally within science, we work in a reductive way. We under, tr seek to understand things by taking them apart into their constituent pieces, understanding each piece. And from that, we seek to understand the whole. Um, this was very much the, uh, uh, the method from you know, uh, figuring out what's wrong with a, with a uh, wristwatch to the Human Genome Project. <coughs> what people have realized though in the later part of the 20th centuries is that this class of complex systems um, uh, that we call technically complex um, uh, need something else beyond that. We need to understand the pieces to be sure, but we need to understand the interconnections between those pieces, the ways in which they relate to one another, because those shape behavior at a higher level that's profoundly different from what you might think would come if you just consider a heap of the pieces together. A jumble of the pieces won't give rise to you the distinctive behaviors that we see writ large here. Um, isolation, you know, understanding of each child in isolation. Um, or uh, the stages of pertussis or chickenpox won't give you an understanding of why we see those cycles any more than understanding the axle types and engine types and number of doors on each car in an in a, on a area of, of roadway will help you understand why there's a traffic jam there. A traffic jam like those cycles that, and like those bell curves we see in infectious disease is something more than the pieces. It's something that transcends each individual and is a collective phenomenon. Systems like this are almost invariably nonlinear. Um, and uh, they come up in many areas beyond infectious disease, people have realized. Much of our work goes on in the intersection of, of uh, these methods with uh, chronic disease and with areas where chronic disease interplays with infectious disease or social determinants of health, um, issues at the intersection with uh, spheres such as uh, social services and justice, um, things like uh, substance abuse and domestic violence and, and uh, opioid addiction and issues with mental health. Um, these spheres, regardless of communicable disease or outside, are nonlinear. Um, and one of the things this means is that the interventions, the impact of a set of interventions, a portfolio, as it were, can be very different than the sum of each in isolation. There can be tipping points. We see this you know, with herd immunity for communicable diseases, you know, where the vaccination campaigns are... are um, secure great uh, promise and hope from the idea if we can just get a bit more of the population vaccinated at a certain point, it could make uh, a qualitative difference uh, between the, uh, the circulating infection, the bug, you know, still finding its ways to form big outbreaks versus just dying out and dying down to very small number of episodic cases. Systems like this, importantly for decision makers, also react surprisingly and pervasively to interventions. 
we poke in one area, say we have um, better screening uh, for hospital admissions tests for, for COVID-19, and it ends up rippling through to affect um, uh, the number of people getting sick in care homes uh, following hospital discharge or the number of, um, the number of school outbreaks. Um, so these systems that we're working with, these complex systems are entangled in ways that are pervasive. They're coupled. This is gonna be really important for the data science we're getting to for methods like CCM um, and for understanding um, these diverse data sets that come from infectious disease outbreaks. And within these systems, the link between cause and effect are often unclear and feedbacks uh, ex exhibit profound influence on system behavior. Feedbacks that can be deleterious, one case turning into two, turning into four, turning into eight, 16, and that heinous doubling that we see playing out before our eyes with Omicron, or, or beneficial feedbacks where you can, through building the health system up, have a resilient system that can resist you know, the, um, uh, the occurrence of a measles um, case within town because you've achieved herd immunity. And the, uh, the system bounces back, even if there's one or two or three measles cases, it resists it spreading. Within these systems, heterogeneity can make a big difference. The effects of scale can be very different. And um, the system adapts over time, like the Omicron variant adapting mutations in ways that allow it to reinfect people who are previously infected or even break through infections over two doses of vaccine that was previously quite protective against Delta, Beta, Gamma, et cetera. Um, and, you know, uh, in a way, we're dealing here with um, moving from a science that's traditionally about understanding the pieces of the elephant in isolation to understanding the elephant as a whole, recognizing that it's not enough to know, just know the shape of the trunk or of the tail or of the ears, but we need to understand the elephant as a whole if we want to stop it rampaging the crops. Um, this from a mural at MIT that I passed many times as an undergraduate, graduate student, but took me many years to fully appreciate its significance. Um, now, there's a, a, a science from the system science side that's been mustered to, to deal with these challenges, complexity science, system science, and some of its first proponents um, were, were those uh, like uh, Ronald Ross and Kermick and McKendrick in the early parts of the 1900s, who recognized that the regularities we see with infectious diseases, those cycles we see, or that bell curve from um, recorded for the bubonic plague in London, um, these are reflective of underlying processes of a system. And these systems have many features which distinguish them. Um, feedbacks, path dependence, emergence, uh, effects of scale, delays, adaptation, um, such as we see with AMR or mutation of viruses to evade vaccines or immunity. Nonlinearities as a central feature um, and uh, kind of a promiscuous feature where we intervene in one place and it pops out in another. In these complex systems, um, we have a devil of a time interpreting evidence. So those first graphs I showed you from New York City, um, you know, trying to make sense of them, take these empirical observations and understand what's going on out there, you know, in the boroughs of New York and the apartment buildings is really challenging when we rely only on informal reasoning. Why do we see these patterns? Why do we see the hospitals rising so quickly? What does that have to do with the high test positivity or the number of, of people that are, that are um, getting tested? But an even deeper challenge comes in when we want to invest resources for action. We need to make a decision, you know, where are we going to put our time and money, our effort, our, our devote our healthcare workers? Is it rolling out boosters? or childhood vaccines? Is it putting in place new mask mandates for, KN90, for N95, KN95 masks in schools, et cetera? 
So when we need to intervene, a lot of challenges you know, come up that force us to look beyond traditional statistical and machine learning techniques to ask where can we best intervene, how to intervene, how soon will I see effects? These are questions about counterfactuals. We don't have data about the effects. We're trying to formulate our best understanding of what will happen to something we've never yet observed. The tools of statistics, which can give us such a rich insight from data we do have, um, start to not offer what we need within these spheres of counterfactuals. So within these areas, um, uh, you know, we, we often have particularly difficult time trying to reason about how to achieve our desired outcomes in terms of public health, health system loading, capacity utilization of our wards or our ICUs and our hospitals. Um, I'm trying to reason about which interventions will give rise to them. When we rely on informal reasoning to say which intervention should we put into place, uh, often it's, it's a matter just of guesswork and of um, political expediency rather than a really substantive grounded understanding. Um, so, you know, the challenges of this are writ large across our health system. Um, uh, infectious diseases has been working to equip itself with these tools for uh, over a century now, and it's furthest along. But in many other areas, what we see is a track record that's full of misperceptions, surprising behavior, policy resistance, where people have tried to put in place interventions, invested heavily in them only to see them not bear out, or even worse, to discontinue them when they were simply, it wasn't realistic to expect them to yet show progress. And they would have shown progress if only they had waited. Um, we see gaps in understanding that results in problems designing systems, coordinating, learning from experience across the different areas. Now, to address this within communicable disease, um, since the work of Ronald Ross in about 1916 or Kermit McKendrick in 27, 28, 29, um, uh, we've turned to a tradition based on ordinary differential equations. And these, of course, have their roots back in the late 1600s with, with Leibniz and Newton, but they've really uh, blossomed within the context of, of a communicable disease modeling. Um, and models uh, built using these techniques, these system science or complexity science techniques, as we would now call them, um, have had a profound impact on understanding the dynamics of infectious disease. And the very language, ladies and gentlemen, that you hear day to day on today's news, talk about the effective reproductive number, um, talk about the doubling time, come out of these models and the realizations of these models. Um, these models have been formulated now for diverse situations and pathogens. Um, and uh, there's a very rich tradition that many of you will appreciate of closed form analysis, of analyzing and finding the equilibria points uh, of a system and reasoning about how the location and the stability of those equilibria depend on the, um, the parameters, the characteristics of the pathogen and the public health response to it. But basically, and we'll be going into this in detail in the next few weeks, um, the next few lectures, I should say, um, in kind of a whirlwind tour. You know, here we're dealing with compartmental models where we might divide up the population, say, into susceptible, infected, and recovered individuals. Um, in reason, um, at any one time, um, everyone is in one of these compartments. And then over time, people shift between these compartments. Some, some people who are infective recover um, according to an average duration of infectiousness. Some people are susceptible, become infected through mixing with infectives. Um, they have contacts, some of which are infective, and uh, that exposes them to infection, which brings them over. And models like this can be rendered um, through substitution of, of short names and variably Greek letters uh, for some of these parameters. 
we can build differential equations. And I had noted last time that I am expecting enough mathematical maturity from people here that you be under you could readily understood the meaning of a differential equation like this, where s dot is the time derivative of the number of susceptibles, i dot the time derivative of the number of, of, of infectives. And briefly speaking, this s dot, you know, is talking about um, how quickly is s changing over time? Um, uh, is it rising by the number of susceptibles rising over time by five people per week, or is it falling? It's minus five, going down by five people per week, et cetera. So these are uh, derivatives, ds dt, di dt, dr dt, but we'll commonly just use s dot, i dot, and r dot. And over here on the right-hand side, you see kind of the constituent equations, which relate how many people, for example, get infected, um, bringing them from the susceptible stock, they're coming out of that, hence the minus, and going into the infective stock, um, the infective state variable here. There, um, here, similarly with this flow for recovery, um, where we have a mean time to recover and people leave it and come into to R. And this should be tau here to be consistent. And you know, we turn to evidence uh, gathered by epidemiologists, for example, as to the incubation period, the time from infection to symptoms, or the latent period, time from infection to infectiousness, or the time that people stay infectious to yield a kind of mean time to infectiousness of tau, or we might call it sometimes um, a mu. And models like this can be run, and we can have, for example, a baseline scenario and an intervention scenario and say, you know, if we could reduce the contact rate, C, um, by 30%, how would that affect the spread of infection? And lo and behold, going from red to blue, it flattens the curve, right? Um, and that very term inspired by this modeling has been, um, has been seared into public consciousness. Um, now, um, researchers within the infectious disease area have long made heavy and rich use of uh, compartmental models. They're extremely versatile. They give high level understanding of the situation that's invaluable. They allow us to do, perform closed form analysis and, and analyze how does the, the stability, the self-sustainability of the health system, its ability to bounce back after you know, arrival of an infectious, how does that depend on these parameters? Um, but when we're dealing with network effects, whether it's for a communicable disease, most classically, or things like obesity, when we deal with spatial effects in the, in the disproportionate burden faced uh, in areas like chlamydia, the sexually, infect, uh, sexually transmitted infection chlamydia in certain areas uh, of, of, our, uh, of our urban municipalities, for example, here uh, Winnipeg um, or, or within Manitoba, we need to broaden our, our tool set. Um, here, the spread of, of rabies, for example, within the New England states, Connecticut here uh, on the right, showing these kind of radial patterns coming out from a center. And um, to address these challenges, many researchers have turned in a growing number of, of, of policy initiatives are guided by um, uh, individual-based models, models that um, often fall under the rubric of of agent-based models, where we distinguish one or more populations of individuals. Each individual is separately represented. Individuals evolve over time, but critically interact over time. Hence these, these little envelopes showing message transitions by which they interact. And individuals evolve here within the model, not as solitudes, but infecting others, being persuaded by others to get tested or seek care. And uh, individuals um, have uh, behaviors that can be quite rich according to aspects of heterogeneity that can also be much richer than is typically possible with a compartmental model. So uh, representation of attitudes with respect to mask use, so participation in gathering, probability of working from home. And we can place these individuals 
This is a model which has been used to advise jurisdictions across the world, uh, created by our group. Um, and um, we can place um, communities and individuals across a map within uh, communities as well as more broadly. And we can create hierarchical models where we have a depiction at multiple scales of say networks of cities and then within each city a network of individuals that might be according to a scale free network. We can capture the textured structure of networks and look at the spread of infection across um, a, a network. And often we bring these models together with elements of, of some representation of immunological status leading to immunoepi models, an area in which our group has, has uh, contributed uh, quite a lot over the years. This can lead to emergence patterns over time, not merely like the cycles we see in those, that kind of bell curve we saw for London, um, um, but, but patterns over space and over networks. Uh, for example, here with uh, prions and, and um, chronic wasting disease for, for deer, uh, a zoo, a zoonoses with some risk of infecting people as well. And we can, with models like this, graph out behave, model behavior over time in response to interventions or in response to a baseline at an aggregate level or look at trajectories of particular individuals, in this case, deer, uh, in other case, people. Um, models like this are stochastic in contrast to those nice deterministic outcomes that we saw earlier. These models invariably are um, are almost invariably are stochastic, and so they lead to distributions of outcomes over time. Um, and uh, models like this are meshed very naturally with results from social network analysis, et cetera. Now, um, system science helps us visualize, understand, and reason about our understanding and, and test consistency with evidence. And one of the way, main ways we do that is system science models. As we'll see, there are other approaches. For example, CCM is a system science, but also a data science technique um, that doesn't need a dynamic model. It's about the underlying system um, and securing direct insights from that underlying system in ways that might clue you in to how you might approach it from dynamic modeling. Um, but dynamic models are central in system science and they represent kind of generative mechanisms. They explicitly posit something about the causal structure of the system, how things might work, and they can serve as thinking tools. They can allow us to refine our assumptions and test those assumptions in the crucible of empirical evidence against uh, the data that's emerging, uh, emerging uh, from the world and, and to reason consistently about interventions. Now, the stance I'd like to take here is important for the sake of the course. And I'd like to, like to make sure people are aware of, of, of my perspective on this. In my view, far from being crystal balls um, or black boxes, models are best used as thinking prostheses that are transparent, that help us learn more quickly um, by putting our assumptions out in the clear light of day, welcoming critique of those assumptions, um, and testing those assumptions uh, against uh, evidence that's emerged. Um, and uh, as such, it's not so much that the model tells you what is right, it more cl quickly clues you in to what is wrong in your thinking, to where your thinking is off base or misplaced, where your cherished prejudices or presuppositions have made their way into the model in ways that, that skew your understanding uh, so that it's not, in, it's not consistent with what we actually see from the world. So these models help us learn more quickly, more consistently, and more thoroughly from empirical evidence when used right. And this is important to the notion of systems data science. It's about leveraging our dynamic modeling. And in part, it's about leveraging our dynamic modeling to more quickly arrive at solid understanding about the world. So we're not so much dealing with a crystal ball as a, as a kind of prosthesis. And this may sound odd. What in the world does this a model, whether it's an ABM or a compartmental model have to do with a prosthesis? Well, it's very simple um, in a certain way. As my colleague, Jeff McDonald, 
uh, puts it. Um, it. Just as a prosthesis, a crutch, a cane, an artificial leg helps us um, uh, move about in the world uh, with close to full function despite our, our inherent limitations, say the loss of a leg. It lets us achieve nearly full functionality despite that limitation. Models help us achieve nearly full functionality despite our cognitive limitations, our limitations and how we're thinking about the system. They help us ask what if questions, test them against evidence, refine our mental model and undertake actions in the world and collect data in ways that further test uh, our formal models as well as our mental models. They clue us into ways to think more uh, robustly, accurately, and judiciously about the situation. So you may recall me noting earlier, when we're dealing with the challenges of communicable disease or any complex system, relying on informal reasoning is hazardous, trying to go from empirical observations, all those time series from New York that I first showed you, back to what's going on in the underlying system, it's really hard to, to, to take, uh, carry that out in our head. But when we have a model that sort of lets us depict what's going on in the underlying world in a compartmental model or a, or a agent-based model or a hybrid model, we can simply run it, you know, execute it, uh, evaluate it over time and see what patterns it produces and test them. Are those consistent with the evidence? We can more quickly spot when our assumptions are best guesses as to what's going on out there in the world as captured by the model are at variance with the empirical observations. Um, and uh, moreover, um, and well, moreover, this helps us reason about alternatives um, to what's going on now, interventions. You could say, if, if only we could lower the contact rate, how much would that help lower the number of reported cases, but how much would it help lower the number of hospital admissions or the number of people that have to, that require ICU care or even that, that perish? Um, we can, using, uh, using a model, we have a, a, a solid way to do that. It's not guaranteed to be correct, but we're more quickly to spot when it's off base than if we rely only on informal evidence. On informal evidence, this is devilishly hard to juggle all these, these thinking in the world. Um, so one of the traditions of dynamic modeling that's influenced my uh, perspective on this a great deal is, is the system dynamics tradition out of MIT. And um, uh, one of the, the leading researchers at MIT in this area, John Sturman, has conducted numerous experiments showing that even the very um, most uh, sophisticated, uh, mathematically um, uh, deeply knowledgeable MIT um, graduate students in science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, engineers with deep understanding of differential equations or math students, when they're presented with a complex system, their ability to reason about how it will behave under counterfactuals is exceptionally poor. It's not a lot better than, than uh, many of us um, or that, that a, than a high school educated individual off the street. Um, but if we couple people with models, if we, if we give them that crutch, that artificial leg, if we give them this leg up as it were, um, we can do far better. And we can actually um, much better anticipate system behavior um, through use of the model, but we can also refine our thinking, our mental model refine this, this mental model that we use to make our quick decisions as well. Um, so that's some work from kind of uh, uh, ex experimental studies involving these tools. So with these simulation models, what do we do with them? Well, there's many uses. One of the most basic uses is to just make explicit our mental models for critique, uh, for discussion, for collective refinement to welcome challenges to it so we can better refine our thinking, to welcome the expertise and the experience of people from other areas who may know more reliably about certain aspects of the system. 
Uh, I argued that models can help us learn more faster, more deeply from evidence by more quickly pointing out when our cherished thinking is off base, when it just doesn't add up to be consistent with the evidence. But these models can also help us in actively managing complex systems by serving as what if tools to identify policies, policies that are high leverage, that will make a rapid impact or cost effective and are robust given the uncertainties. They can help us evaluate benefits of restructuring the system, understand trends and understand those, all those different facets, the different faces of the underlying system that I showed you from New York in those opening graphs. Those are all different whispers from an underlying system, different um, faces of that same underlying system. And these models can help us understand why we see those patterns across all of them and recognize that they're not solitudes, they're not independent, but they're reflective of an underlying common reality. Um, and of course, models can help us prioritize research and data collection through sensitivity analyses and understand classes of context in which certain strategies are best applied. And when used properly, and we've done a lot of this, they can be very effective communication tools for communities or for, for stakeholders to really understand the choices before them. But models like these, um, as, as strong and as powerful as they are, face real challenges. One of those challenges is rapid obsolescence. Um, commonly with these modeling projects, we build the model and then we use it for insight, but it becomes increasingly outdated. It's depicted in an initial state, which may be increasingly at variance with what we see in the world. Um, uh, and while we can update the model, it's often a very heavyweight manual process um, involving potentially months of work or, or reparameterization that takes many weeks um, uh, in a way that's cumbersome and that prevents us always incorporating new evidence. Um, a model like this also inevitably diverges. Even the most judiciously built model, built with the very latest of evidence and best understanding, inevitably diverges from the external world. Um, it diverges uh, from what we see in the world, not because in, in some cases, it's not because of a deep problem with the model, just, you know, we can't be expected to anticipate chance events, um, that chance adverse event where, you know, a clandestine party was held um, or that infected person, that infected healthcare worker who, who uh, uh, you know, tested negative because of a false negative, uh, came into the ward uh, with lots of chronic disease uh, uh, patients and ended up infecting them grievously. Uh, we can't anticipate when people will happen to arrive who happen to be infected from overseas. And as a result, you know, the model's expectations may um, end up not capturing that early outbreak. Um, or the, the spate of good luck, which prevented the outbreak for extra long. But you know, realistically, when we build models, we often do so very quickly. Our first COVID-19 models were built in their most basic form you know, before the pandemic was, uh, was declared, if I'm not mistaken. We started them in, in February 2020. And inevitably they omit factors, there's approximations, there's misunderstandings. We didn't understand until, you know, for another two or three months, how important asymptomatic individuals were and, and how infectious they could be. Um, there was uncertainty about the degree to which people could be reinfected, et cetera. So models become outdated. And um, this also um, leads them to limits their, their effectiveness particularly given how hard it is to update them. Finally, often there's a real shortage of evidence for them um, to inform them. Um, we can build our agent-based models um, uh, to, to inform jurisdictions, but often we need to make assumptions about individual behavior with respect to gatherings, with respect to mobility and mixing, with respect to mask use, with respect to uh, attitudes vis-a-vis um, -vis quarantining or isolation 
where we don't have really good evidence. It hasn't come out yet, or it's very difficult to, to collect. Um, and uh, often it's that evidence about individual behaviors where it, it's grievously absent. Um, and this can really limit our ability to qualitatively evaluate health policy trade-offs. So system science is an incredibly powerful tradition, one that's evolved by leaps and bounds and which has formidable tools at its disposal. And that has proven invaluable um, uh, within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, just like many pandemics and outbreaks and epidemics before it. But increasingly we recognize the need to deal with these challenges um, and, and quite a few others as well. Um, and uh, partly because of this divergence between models and observations, many have been working with the tools of, of a newer um, sphere. Uh, system science at some level goes back to the starts of the 1900s. Data science, goes back a couple decades um, in its current form. I took my first machine learning course in 1991, so 30 years ago and so on, where it was known as machine intelligence and pattern recognition. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a, a far newer enterprise than, than system science. Um, it's one that focuses centrally around empirical evidence that welcomes models, but, but seeks to be educated more directly by the evidence, seeks to, to, to base decisions more centrally on that uh, emerging evidence, particularly evidence that's fine-grained, that's high velocity, high volume, uh, high, high variety, and high, uh, uh, high veracity as well, the four Vs. Um, so data science, you know, uh, viewed more broadly is or mechanisms, proceed, principles, practices, and infrastructure, tools, and methodologies for drawing insight from data. It has a particular focus on, on big data. And machine learning, which is going to be the central tool of data science we focus on in this course, is a key analysis tool. We will be talking about big data and its unique features, smartphone data, social media data, search data, data from from measurements in the world like wastewater environmental sensors. But a lot of our attention will be on the machine learning areas. Um, big data as it relates to health is all around us. Um, uh, I've just rattled off a few of many areas that have proven their metal in the context of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And often this data is, is characterized by these four volume, uh, four Vs that Google has has described, although sometimes people add a fifth uh, value uh, as well. Um, I could go into this more, but we'll have a lecture on it, and, and I, I, I don't want to um, uh, jump the gun there. Um, but within this sphere, um, researchers and increasingly um, those seeking to inform decision making turn to many types of tasks, uh, inference tasks, classification. Um, tasks, uh, for example, classifying, is this COVID-19 patient at high risk of needing ICU care? Um, inferring the number of underlying undiagnosed people out there. Um, uh, in, inferring um, what the current situation is projecting forward. This is gonna occupy a lot of our attention. Um, understanding the hidden situation that's out there right now, um, with all this testing madness going on with Omicron and all these incomplete reporting and so many antigen tests that, that never get called in, uh, even if they're positive and always if they're negative and, um, you know, changing, um, uh, changing mix of Delta and Omicron patients, et cetera. Um, uh, there's a need to recognize patterns sometimes, pattern of an incipient outbreak uh, or finding a desire to find hidden structure uh, and data. And with these areas, for example, we often reason about tools that are database, such as support vector machines uh, or hidden Markov models that will allow us to distinguish here between smokers and non-smokers or here 
for example, classifying someone's behavior based on data from their smartphone? Are they sitting, standing, walking, et cetera? Or are they in contact with another? Are they in close proximity to another? Um, we use uh, these sorts of methods with many types of data, including many types of non-traditional data that have, have traditionally been less um, the central focus of, of health uh, biostatistics, for example. Um, uh, where we might have, for example, training data sets of tweets and we're classifying influenza versus non-influenza related tweets or something we've done or, or COVID-19 tweets, uh, another recent focus of, of much of our lab's activity or some of our lab's activity. And within these areas, we might judge the effectiveness of this classifier with something called the receiver operating characteristic curve. Um, using, for example, decision trees or logistic or aggression or random forest models. And it's not so much that these are inherently machine learning methods. You could object that logistic or aggression is a biostatistical method, but it's how we use that method. The methodologies like cross-validation we use to undertake it that are distinguishing it. We can recognize coughing behavior, for example, or the behavior of, of an ill person uh, in a hospital that might summon a nurse. Um, within these spheres, researchers have sought to project forward um, uh, the number of cases, for example, um, whether it's end-stage renal disease incidents or number of hospitalizations for COVID-19. Now, within the sphere of machine learning, we have enormous potential. And indeed, uh, techniques like deep learning have been taking the world by storm for their ability to, to perform incredibly sophisticated recognition um, and identification tasks, for example, that have been traditionally thought to require uh, humans. Um, but there's common challenges with them explaining the results, interpreting the results coming out of a deep learning model can be very challenging. Um, there are uh, ways to, to help uh, enhance that, um, uh, but, uh, but it's one of the larger challenges. Um, often and quite typically, um, commonly, uh, these techniques are applied on each data set in isolation. So they look at that data set of cases over time or of hospitalizations separately over time and try to project it forward in isolation. They're not reasoning about them as, as all different faces of an underlying system like we do in system science. And there's difficulties reasoning here about counterfactuals because often what we're doing is we're training to an exquisite degree and a more generalizable degree, hopefully, there are ways to help enhance that um, uh, to uh, about um, how this system can classify given data we have in place from the past. And the risk here is that, um, you know, we're relying on things in the future being similar to things in the past. And if we have a slow changing data generating process, we're still dealing with the Wuhan strain of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, for example, on um, the wild type. Um, it can be challenging. Um, uh, it, it can be effective to sort of try to generalize from, you know, the data six months ago to going forward. But if we're trying to, if we're trying to generalize from what we saw with alpha last spring, to what we to, to try to understand patterns we see now with with Omicron, we're um, you know we're on a fool's errand. We're in for for real challenges because we have very different patterns now uh, for Omicron than we did for Delta or than we did for Alpha or Wild type of COVID nineteen. Um, and when we're trying to intervene, when we're trying to bend the curve, flatten the curve, alter. To, to a healthier health future, um, to, a, to a health, you know, a, a better health future, um, that can change those patterns dramatically. And this reflects the fact that many of these methods um, are associational in character. Thing like re, uh, logistic regression that's so central to biostatistics is all about teasing apart um, variability in the outcome 
into variability with, with respect to different covariates, different explanatory variables or features as we call them in machine learning. Um, and uh, no matter how rich the data about the past is, it's contingent on the data generating process that gave rise to them. And these associations will almost inevitably change if we intervene in a big way upon the system. So we introduce vaccination or um, we uh, end up uh, instituting, you know, universal um, uh, vaccination requirements for medium and large scale businesses uh, as they have uh, in the US. Um, or if we, um, if we seek to, to understand how the onset of winter and changes to people's contact patterns from moving indoors will change things um, based on data from the summer. Um, in all these cases, the risk here is it's like we're trying to drive forward uh, looking out our rear view mirror. You know, we're trying to anticipate what's coming up on the road using evidence from what's behind us. If we're in one of those circular race tracks that seem to occupy bizarrely much of people, certain people's time uh, watching them, watching cars go around in a circle at high speeds, um, maybe what's behind us will be fairly indicative of what's ahead of us. But um, if we're going off road, as we are with, uh, with infectious disease outbreaks, what lies behind us is often a poor, a pale cipher, a poor judge for what we see going forward. We need ways of, of looking forward. Now, I'd like to, to argue, having sort of laid out the strengths and weaknesses of, 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 of some of aspects of system science on the one hand and data science on the other, I want to argue that uh, this is far from like joining two sinking boats. It's actually a case where each can complement the limitations of the other. And more than that, each can synergize with the other to yield a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. We can move, um, as Phil Zuckerman said, beyond myth and madness here. Phil Zuckerman, an epidemiologist, once argued, theory without data is myth, and data without theory is madness. Theory is what we capture in our dynamic models, compartmental models, agent-based models. That's operationalized theory. We're taking our theory, putting it into precise, not, not always accurate, but precise terms, precise enough to be simulated, and, sim and we can simulate it. That's our theory. Um, but without data, he argues it's, it's myth. And data without theory, as some have aspired to in data science, I would argue, is madness. We need models to make sense of the data, to understand its patterns within a given data set and across data sets. And we need to understand what is it including, what is it not including, what are its blind spots, et cetera. So there's a tremendous compatibility here between data science and system science that's been rarely commented because few are the practitioners with deep training in both and deep practice in both. The authenticity of having undertaken you know, large numbers of projects in both of them. Um, uh, so, but, uh, if you look beyond the surface, there's some deep compatibilities. One is um, that uh, good um, system science is articulating models at the level of causal pathways, at the level of putative causal mechanisms, what are called generative pathways in uh, critical realist theory, uh, critical realist philosophy, um, and sometimes go by that name within the health sciences. Um, and it turns out that, that data science through mechanisms like wearable technologies and smartphones, um, sometimes through social media, can often give us resolution at that level. Both give us kind of a way of reasoning about behavior over time that's often very fine grained. Data from smartphones, from my accelerometer, from my Bluetooth sensor for checking contact patterns, my GPS, is really high velocity data compared to traditional data sources uh, used in epidemiology. Um, and in system science, um, I'm depicting behavior over time as well. And uh, both of these have that in common. Both can inform that understanding of behavior over time. Um, 
uh, in, data, in system science, a growing number of, of models are articulated at an individual level. Um, in communicable disease area, it's most commonly agent-based models. Um, and uh, we can capture individual level behavior and compare it with uh, data from, from smartphones or from, um, from uh, interactions with, uh, uh, through, for example, from interactions with online sites, et cetera. Um, we can capture individual context and geography or networks um, and reason about it in both and reasoning about uh, effects of interventions more quickly. Uh, so uh, develop theory about what might happen in the context of intervention and more quickly clue into the new patterns using uh, big data tools. So let's talk about these. Um, the center, uh, so this is a matter of compatibility. I'd like to talk about synergies but be, um, between these. And there are many synergies, too many for me to cover it here in the next uh, 15 minutes. But I want to hit on uh, just a few of them. Um, so um, uh, these two can come together with a couple key principles of system data science. Um, uh, one thing is to recognize that different data sources are often drawn from an underlying unified system. Um, they're not solitudes, um, and analyzing them in a fragmented fashion, a fashion that separates them out and analyze each in isolation is risking a lack of insight. They're in fact coupled. And if you, if you accept that, um, they're, they're, they're in fact coupled, um, the opportunity is huge to turn the tools of data science um, into supporting tools to help us understand those underlying systems the systems which give rise to those, all those different data sources we saw from New York City in those opening slides, for example, those different faces of the underlying situation. Um, the, uh, the tools of, of system science also can complement those of data science by cluing us into system-wide understanding, um, understanding that extends across the breadth of the system without needing data from every part of the system. If we can get rich data, data collected through big data or, or systematically sampled data over time for certain parts of a system, what system science tells us is that can illuminate, that can shed light on, that can help explicate what's going on across many areas of a system. That's a bold claim but it's underlain by theory from dynamical systems that we'll be getting to, um, and by Taken's theorem in particular. Um, the argument here is in a coupled nonlinear system, what goes, in one, what goes on in one area, say in um, the number of, of new occurrences of infection, ripples through and affects all the other areas. It affects the number of cases that are reported a bit later, it affects the number of hospitalizations. Um, oh, you know, 10 days later after the infection or, or two weeks later. It affects as well um, the number of individuals who are being discharged from the ICU or the number of individuals who are tragically perishing. Um, all of these are coupled in with that. And if we have a, a lot of individuals being diagnosed, for example, that may reduce the number of people who are still susceptible or circulating out there infecting others. In short, within these complex systems, what goes on in one area ripples through to affect often a large fraction of that system. And so data from one area can illuminate, if we use it in the right way, can illuminate other areas of the system. Um, if we connect it systematically, richly, and rigorously using the tools of data science. Um, now, uh, data science um, can help us more quickly uh, learn and spot our mistakes with system science tools. This commitment to models as learning tools make, helps us use data science to more quickly spot uh, their gaps um, in, our, in our thinking, for example. Um, uh, and yet at the same time, we can use new data coming in from the world on a day-to-day -day basis, on a data point by data point way 
to improve our model, to help the model learn automatically using the tools of machine learning, um, learning from data. Um, uh, so here, the model's understanding of what's going on right now comes partly through the model, but partly through the evidence. It clues it into which way things actually resolved. Did that outbreak occur earlier or later? It was up to chance, and maybe it occurred earlier and the model's on it. The model is, has recognized that and is anticipating, okay, given that it occurred, where is this going immediately? We can learn more quickly from intervention effects. Um, we have maybe some expectations from the model, but we can more quickly clue in to which parts of them are in fact consistent um, with what we see in the world and which parts are going off, uh, off base and, and, and uh, cl uh, correct the model's understanding. And we can reason about counterfactuals um, in light of this. Um, okay. Um, I don't have much time to talk about these things, and I, I'd like to, to work quickly to wrap up here. Um, I will just note that each of these is buttressed um, by some slides that I'll be sharing with you in case you want to uh, dive into it more. Um, this notion of reasoning about underlying systems, uh, for example, um, uh, is a, a key clue for helping us to more savvily understand data from the world. Um, and uh, data from the world on certain spheres of a system, for example, uh, can be, uh, in, if it's traditional data, often it's on uh, very few areas of the system, only occasionally. And if it's collected with big data, can, it can draw in data from a broader set of areas of the system. Um, in a way that can also illuminate the broader system. This is from a model uh, built by our TA, Sha Yan Li, of uh, opioid abuse um, uh, and data in certain spheres of the system, data whose annotations are shown here, can shed light on what's going on in other spheres um, of, of the system more broadly. I have some graphs of that later on. Um, Okay, um, and uh, just watching here so I can finish up. Um, within the sphere, one of the things that's gonna occupy much of our attention is going to be this process of always updating models on a constant basis. We're gonna be discussing a set of methods for undertaking this um, that um, provide uh, successively richer ways of undertaking it. We're gonna start with something like hidden Markov models, understanding what's going on in a hidden, in an underlying system um, based on uh, data collected at discrete time points and in a system that exists in a set of discrete states. We'll then go on to discuss approximate Bayesian computation, which is a simpler method, doesn't require formal likelihood functions to be formalized. Um, that gives us some clue as to um, the, the model, um, uh, which, which model assumptions are most grounded. Um, subsequently, um, we'll be looking at particle filtering, which gives us, as data comes in, um, some grounded understanding of the full state of the system gives us a, a distribution, a joint distribution over the state vector at a given time, the latent state of the system, both things that are observed and things that are not observed um, in ways that allow us to reason about system behavior going forward. So maybe we have empirical data points, we ground the system in it through formal likelihood functions and through a process based on sequential importance sampling and we get out a distribution of what the model expects to be playing out, for example, at different points in time, but also a depiction of the distributions associated with the underlying states of the system or stocks of this system. Here, this particular model has four, four states or four stocks. Um, and what we see data-wise clues us into uh, a distribution as to what's likely the case 
for the number of susceptibles or the number of infectives right now, or the number of people who are exposed but not yet infective, or the number of recovered people. So a model like this is being constantly challenged by data, recurrently regrounded, say regrounded every day, or in this case, it's every month over the period of, of many years, many decades. Um, and its understanding is being updated. This is exactly the sort of work that we've done for all the provinces in Canada, for all the First Nations reserves, um, and for our, our local health system, for our provincial health system um, on a daily basis. Um, so taking data that comes out daily and rendering it into understanding of, of what's likely the case. Uh, Cheyenne did the same thing with particle MCMC models, which are more sophisticated yet, to, to basically have some understanding on um, the number of individuals out there in the population in different states for those in ways that could be compared with data and for some that could not be compared with data. The result of this is kind of a population tomography. It's like taking data from many different sources, cases, tests, hospital admissions, ICU admissions, deaths, uh, wastewater measurements, putting it all together in a way that gives you a 3D view of the underlying system state, of the underlying state of the system at any one time. And just like a, a weather model may be very good, but we'd never trust it, a weather model, which was only updated with data till let's say um, uh, a month ago to predict tomorrow's weather, we'd want to model that same model updated with the very latest data to anticipate whether it will snow tomorrow in each of our jurisdictions. So it is with these models. They're kept constantly updated by the latest evidence that clues them in to what's going on now, what's the current underlying situation, and allows them to project forward much more reliably. Um, or like a GPS, maybe our original path expected us to be at a certain place at a certain time. But given where we actually are at this time, it'll recalculate where we need to go um, to achieve our objectives. So um, in the closing minutes here, I want to offer a, a brief synthesis of this, a few key take home messages. Um, each of data science and system science are incredibly rich and powerful traditions. Um, system science uh, for allowing us to, to posit aspects of the structure of external systems in ways that explain diverse behaviors of the system, allow us to better anticipate, understand trends, anticipate where the system might be going and ask what if questions, if we could change this, if we could change that. Data science for taking emergent evidence, particularly high velocity evidence, high volume as evidence, and rendering it into insights that clue us in more quickly to underlying patterns when there might be an outbreak about to happen, for example, um, or whether an individual patient is likely to end up in the ICU, um, the degree to which there might be more undiagnosed infectives out there given, um, given a change in test positivity, um, but also a change in test volume. Each of these techniques is very rich in and of itself. Um, and they have important roles, key roles to play in informed modeling decision-making and health and healthcare and the actual care processes and, and beyond. Um, but they also are each equipped when taken in isolation with key shortcomings that limit their potential, limit their, their reach. Um, and uh, I argue that data and system science uh, are not merely complementary, um, despite being undertaken by, diverse, by different communities with, uh, with very little overlap um, and, and uh, rare that a student is exposed to both. Um, but they're, they're actually synergistic and, and systems data science offers this opportunity to leverage system science with data science. I didn't have time, for example, to tell you about how data science techniques can clue us in to 
what causal structure we need in our model to explain the data um, can clue us in to whether a given model is sufficient to explain the data, um, to whether one factor might be driving another factor or vice versa. Um, uh, data science can help us more quickly debug our model structure, correct our misunderstandings and our cherished prejudices. But system science can help data science too, provide it a more rich understanding of data sources that are just reflections of different faces of, an, of a common underlying situation. System science can help us reason about counterfactuals um, that traditionally um, flummox uh, data science can help us reason about what lies ahead, not merely what lies behind us. And the enterprise of systems data science uh, supports understanding that can really help us reason robustly about counterfactuals, including effects of interventions where we try to bend the curve uh, to learn far faster and deeper from incoming evidence than we could with either in isolation. Um, recognize system-wide implications of evidence from one particular area of a system. That big data we collect with data science, it can go much further with the tools of system science because it illuminates the broader system, which is coupled. So what goes on in the area we measure whispers to us, hints to us about what's going on in other areas. And it can provide a common picture um, from evidence um, uh, as to what's going on, kind of a consensus understanding of what's going on in the system. It can help us finally inform our understanding of, of the causal structure of the system in a way that's more robust um, than either in isolation. So um, uh, those are all my comments uh, for today. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an invitation to systems data science. In this course, we'll be providing you with the key tools of systems data science um, and uh, some of the perspective which influences those tools and uh, showing how these tools can be leveraged on a day to provide day-to-day -day value to enhance decision-making about some of society's most troubling challenges most vexing and most entangled challenges, uh, particularly those associated with the challenges of communicable and infectious diseases. So um, that's a kickoff to the substantive materials of this course. Um, I hope um, that this gives a little bit of a sense as to some of where we might be going. Within our next session, we're gonna jump more wholeheartedly into an exploration of system science techniques. Um, we'll be taking a close look at compartmental models and particularly compartmental models of communicable disease. We'll uh, review for those who have seen it before or introduce for those who haven't um, a, uh, a set of uh, well-traveled well uh, patterns for characterizing communicable disease transmission on um, using compartmental models. We'll also take some look at how we can use uh, agent-based modeling um, to complement some of the limitations of our uh, compartmental models. Um, and uh, using those tools will equip us to, uh, to start addressing some of the major needs of systems data science by coupling them together with techniques from machine learning and computational statistics. So that's all for today. Um, I uh, look forward to seeing some of you in office hours. I will be uh, starting those in about five or 10 minutes here uh, after a quick health break, uh, and we'll continue on on this very channel. If I'm disconnected, I will be reconnecting to this channel and look forward to talking with some of you um, at those office hours. So thanks very much. Take care there and stay safe.